Let me just get a, a couple of words in here, because I have talked to Attorney Gerald a couple of times. First of all, that letter landing, dated December 14th, got some members of the Budget Committee upset. That appeared to be a, a threatening type of communication. Uh, I have talked to Attorney Gerald a couple of times. We have a little concern about getting counsel paid, and it wasn't easy to find counsel in the week between Christmas and New Year's. But nevertheless, when I talked with Rusty and Vice Chair Waddell around the 12th of January, roughly, I asked the two of you if I could meet with you. We were talking about compensating counsel, but we also uh, talked about a couple of other things with the emails. And Rusty, you said that you gave me permission to call Attorney Buckley, right? Right. Now, I didn't know because nobody told me, because it had been six years since I chaired the Budget Committee, I didn't know that there was a list of approved people who could call the NHMA. So when I called Attorney Buckley and got a rather rude reception, I was huffing and puffing, and one member of the committee said to me, well, gee whiz, why don't you just, uh, you know, call or talk to Attorney Gerald? So the next time I was in the town office, I said, you know, what's, what's going on? Uh, Attorney Buckley was rather rude to me. Uh, haven't you notified him? Or if you haven't, would you tell him that Nick Bridle is no longer the chair? So and please inform him that I'm the chairman. And I walked off. I, I saw him face to face in his office. And I said, you know, would you do that for me? And I, I took off. I expected that would be done. Shortly after that, the Board of Selectmen voted to cut everybody off, except for the five top favored entities. When you told me that I could ca call Attorney Buckley, Rusty, I did. And we had a half hour, very cordial chat. He was kind enough to forward to me the attachments that I forwarded to all of you, including the amicus curiae brief. And one thing he said to me, and, and the only suggestion he made to me was, you want to be using BCC, blind carbon copy, whatever the heck that is. As soon as he told me that, that is what I started doing. I had a couple of other conversations with him, but then I asked, <laughs> I asked him about the selectman's authority to have control over the budget committee, zoning board, and planning board budgets with the legal line in them. I said, can I know the selectmen have control and the town manager has control over the departments. The planning, zoning, and budget committee are not departments. So I asked Attorney Buckley if he could clarify this for me. And he got back to me with this email. It is with regret that I must inform you that the charge I was given by your select board was that I was limited to giving right to know law advice only to you as chairman, but rather than the, re let's see, uh, your questions do not deal with the right to know law, but rather the relationship among town attorney, town manager, and budget committee. I'm unable to provide legal advice to the chair of budget committee in these operations. We are paying $17,000 a year to the NHMA, and they are very helpful. When they're accessible. What, when they're accessible. But Steve can tell you from past experience, police officers have been calling. It. I've called them in the past, no problem. Second consideration, Attorney Gerald told me that he, he, I told him, I said, I'll tell you, because I bumped him to an, into him in the town office, and I said, I talked with Attorney Buckley. I did exactly what he told me to do. I've been using BCC ever since. And Gerald said, well, I don't agree with that. He said, that's, that, that's a risky thing, too. So now I've got Attorney Buckley from the NHMA telling me one thing. I've got Attorney Gerald telling me something else. Then we have a series of emails between Attorney Buckley and Mark Gerald. Um, 
January 4th. Mark, I concur that the prohibition on electronic communication found in RSA 91A was probably not intended to deny public bodies the use of email to receive information only communications. Given the ruling in the Porter case, it nevertheless is safer to always ensure the emails sent to a quorum are distributed using the blind CC method of distribution so that no one member who receives the email could hit reply all and possibly create an illegal electronic meeting. I also agree with your assessment that a number of the emails you cite among Hampton Budget Committee members constitute violations of RSA 91A. Um, I spoke to Mark Gerald last Thursday when I was in the town office and I said, Mark, you and I have known each other since you came on as the attorney in this town. Why couldn't you pick up the phone instead of sending out all these certified letters and getting everybody upset and demanding copies of emails? You have about every email I sent because I copy you, like Bob and Ginny, on every confounded email I produce. And I said to him, just, you know, just what do you want me to do? And he said, use the mail. Now further, the uh, email here from uh, Attorney Buckley once again. If the, good morning Mark, if the Porter versus Sandwich order on the merits dated August 14, 2015 is interpreted in a particular manner, I would agree that Woolsey's emails dated 11-29 and 12-1 created the opportunity for a reply by a quorum of a public body. In that light, and based upon Judge Temple's interpretation of RSA 91A, those emails would be Ill illegal electronic meetings because they were sent to a quorum of the Hampton Budget Committee, and there was an ability to communicate contemporaneously. This interpretation is founded on the facts in Porter being almost the same situation involving the Woolsey emails. In Porter, it was the chairman of the ZBA who sent the email to the entire membership of the ZBA. And the same is true concerning the emails courtesy copied by Woolsey to a quorum of the Hampton Budget Committee. Caution must be exercised, however, because the Porter decision could be interpreted to mean that any time a quorum of a public body receives an email from an elected or appointed official from the same municipality that would create an ability to communicate contemporaneously and therefore constitute an illegal electronic meeting. So now I have town council, and we're not lawyers. None of us are lawyers. And we're struggling through this stuff. I said to Mark, have you, you got my packet, Rusty, that was given directly to you as chairman. Copies of my emails in here, most of them begging for information. And I said, have you gone through those? Most of the people on the budget committee have given you their copies, their information. And he said, oh, I've been too busy. Excuse but me. But he wasn't too busy to write that, was he? <laughs> huh? He wasn't. This is the whole point. He wasn't too busy to write that. No, now, but you know what? He has, been, he has been very busy. Yes, right? well, but he's not, after sending us threatening letter, be a certified you know how many mail. emails there are to go through? Threat mm -hmm. Hundreds. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not finished. Now I have communicated with Attorney Buckley, and when you and, and Vice Chairman Waddell and I met, Rusty, uh, and we were talking about the emails, I said, I really, in hindsight, I understand I should not have sent the email to everybody saying people were beefing about pay raises. And you said, yeah, but that, you know, that wasn't uh, the Mount Vesuvius volcano. But now what, situa what situation are we in here? We've got town council telling us one thing on that BCC. Attorney Buckley, who's being paid through the NHMA to give us another opinion, and he said, go right ahead and do that. And if you read, and I hope all of you read the amicus brief, but what caught my eye, and it's an excellent brief, Attorneys Buckley, Johnston, and uh, Burns collaborated on this amicus curiae, friend of the court brief, and the Porter versus Sandwich situation. And this is the Supreme Court. This is where it will be advertised. 
Uh, Attorney Gerald told me he agreed with Judge Temple's ruling, which is only a superior court ruling. But he said Judge Temple is a smart young man. Well, I don't know whether he is or not, but we're caught in a legal tangle here. Um, on page 16 of the amicus brief, attorneys Buckley and Johnston and Burns say, Similarly, the Municipal Association's booklet cited above draws a clear distinction between two situations. In the first, a land use board member sends an email to all other members expressing an opinion on a matter before the board, but no member sends a substantive response. In the second, a substantive discussion ensues via email. Conclusion, in the first situation, identical to what happened here, there is no violation. In the second, the exchange clearly violates the law because it is a use of communications outside a meeting to circumvent the law. CNH, local government center, etc. The effect of the trial court's ruling, that's the superior court, if allowed to stand, would be to prohibit any member of a public body from ever sending an email to other members on any subject within the body's jurisdiction. Again, this ignores the practical reality of life in the 21st century. When the email does not lead to anything remotely resembling a discussion or deliberation or an action, there is no reason for the action to be prohibited. In its 2004 final report, the Right to Know Study Commission noted with favor Justice Holmes' comment that the machinery of government would not work if it were not allowed a little play in its joints. This court is urged to bear that admonition in mind and not make it impracticable for local public bodies to conduct their business when there is no legitimate threat to the public's right to know. 